There are two problems with an antimatter bomb. First of all, it is possible. It's within the laws of physics. The first problem is cost. It would bankrupt the United States to make enough antimatter for a bomb. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars to create micrograms, minuscule quantities of antimatter with our atom smashers. And it would simply be too expensive when nuclear weapons are relatively cheap by comparison. A hydrogen bomb, believe it or not, only costs a few million dollars. It would bankrupt the Earth to build an antimatter bomb. Second, where would you put it? Antimatter annihilates with matter. Therefore, if you put an antimatter bomb in a bottle, the bottle blows up. And so there's no way to contain antimatter except with very complicated magnetic fields. And then that adds to the cost of an antimatter bomb. Plus the fact that all the antimatter that so far has been created in our laboratories would not light up a light bulb. Black holes come in all sizes. The more energy you have, the bigger they are. When you see them on television or being photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope, they have the energy of a million stars. However, these black holes that the Large Hadron Collider may produce are microscopic in size, meaning they have microscopic energy. So you could not even light up a light bulb with the black holes produced by the Large Hadron Collider. They're not going to eat up the Earth. They are subatomic in size. Plus, cosmic rays from outer space have more energy than the energy produced by the Large Hadron Collider. And we don't see uh, giant black holes eating up the Earth from outer space. So in other words, uh, we shouldn't let our imagination get the best of us. These microscopic black holes have microscopic energy. Well, we do think that the Large Hadron Collider will give us a mini Big Bang, but it's not going to be a strange lit that eats up the universe. Uh, think of the Midas touch. King Midas was the king. Anything he touched turned to gold. Well, there is a theory, a rather bizarre theory, that says if you have enough what are called strange matter or strange lists and you touch it, then you turn to strange matter. Uh, just like, for example, uh, Medusa would turn everything to stone, this thing would turn the entire universe to strangelets. However, no physicist that I know takes it seriously. It's like a mother using the boogeyman to get the children to behave. We physicists sometimes drag out the strangelets to scare the pants off people, but only as a joke. It's not really taken seriously, plus the fact that our sun has not been turned into a strange um, uh, sun. It absorbs cosmic rays and matter from outer space at a much higher rate than the Earth. And the sun is perfectly stable. Neutron stars, we've looked at them. They're perfectly stable. We see no evidence of this bizarre theory, which, again, once in a while we drag out just to scare the pants off people. But it's not serious. Well, we are faced with an energy crisis and also the threat of global warming. And so we have to look at long-term sources of energy. For example, a solar hydrogen economy, perhaps in 20 years. But even on a 40-year time frame now, fusion starts to become very attractive. The French have made the ITER a national priority, and the Americans and the Japanese have joined in. Much of the physics the physics of plasmas, the physics of beams, are very similar to the physics of the Large Hadron Collider. So one of the spin-offs, one of the spin-offs of the Large Hadron Collider is that we hope to be able to get a handle on new sources of energy. And just remember, the atom is very small. How do we know so much about the atom, which will one day give us new sources of energy? We smash them apart. That is the only known way that we can extract information from tiny objects that you cannot even see. And we think the future of the human race will be based on the physics that we get by smashing atoms and peering into the nucleus of the atom. We physicists are at the cutting edge of all technologies, laser technology, transistor technology, telecommunications, the iPods and the space satellites, and all this information that we get around us are byproducts of atomic physics. And we know so much about atomic physics because of our work with atom smashers. And in the medical field, if you have problems with your brain, PET scans allow us to see the living brain second by second actually thinking 
And we do this with positrons, anti-electrons with antimatter. And antimatter was pioneered by atom smashers. In fact, we can create beams of antimatter now with our atom smashers. So when you look at MRI scans, PET scans, when you look at all the uh, medical tracers, radioactive tracers that we use to scan the body, all of them, all of them are spin-offs of atomic physics, and atomic physics in turn is driven by atom smashers. That's how we know so much about them.